Well, good morning, everyone. It's 11 o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started with today's webinar as we have a lot of great information um, coming from Sarah today. So I'd like to introduce myself first. My name is Lori Fetzer. I'm a dairy lending specialist here at Compure Financial in the Baldwin office, of which it seems to look like it's storming out there right now. Um, but I certainly want to thank everyone for their participation today. I know it's been a challenging spring with winter kill, late planting, maybe some prevent plant um, and some super wet areas, but we certainly do appreciate everyone taking the time to join us on this webinar. So the webinar today is a value added webinar that we're doing for clients of Compure Financial and also for some industry professionals um, as well that we invited to join on. A couple housekeeping items for today's call. Everyone will be muted throughout the call just to avoid any distractions um, or background noises so that everyone's able to participate and hear as we go through the webinar. And also, um, if you do have a question, we strongly encourage it. There's gonna be four sections throughout the presentation that Sarah will be going through today. If you have a question down in the lower right-hand corner of your screen is a chat function. Make sure that you're um, sending the message either to all participants or to all panelists, and we'll monitor that throughout the webinar and make sure that your questions get asked as we go as well. So we'll be taking questions at the end of each section, or we'll also make sure we've got some time at the end of our hour break here um, to make sure that we get your questions answered as well. Um, so with that, I would like to introduce our speaker for today, Sarah Dorland. Sarah is the managing partner in Series Dairy Risk Management, specializing in providing risk management, market research, and financial consulting services to agricultural and food-based business industry to clients throughout the entire supply chain. Ms. Dorland works with dairy producers, cooperatives, manufacturers, and consumer product companies. Her knowledge base includes a broad array of hedging activities, go-to market techniques for both domestic and international sales, as well as education and consulting on a wide variety of dairy industry topics. In addition to series, Ms. Dorland is a contributor to the Daily Dairy Report. And for some of you have already asked how you can subscribe to that, and we'll cover that at the end of the webinar as well. Sarah has her MBA from Seattle University and lives with her husband and two daughters in Sun Valley, Idaho. So with that, I'd like to welcome Sarah to the webinar and hand it over to her. So what we're going to do is we're going to, as Lori said, we're going to break this into four sections today. Um, I thought we'd talk about feed markets first um, because it's a major influence on farm margins. It's also having a pretty tremendous impact on the trajectory for milk prices um, into this year and actually at the start of next year. We're going to take a look at a few market disruptor, disruptors. And, and what we're going to look at there is the new operating environment um, for U.S. dairy and what this means going forward, some of the patterns that we've been picking up on um, and, and the implications to the, the U.S. dairy industry. I'm going to talk a little bit about risk management. Um, and this is applicable whether uh, dairy processor, dairy farm. Um, it's just some of the um, market disruptors are really making risk management um, more of a necessity going forward in order to um, somewhat avoid some of these pitfalls that we've run into over the last few years. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about outlook and forecast um, and things that really could be coming at us um, towards the end of the year. Um, just a little heads up, it's actually some good news for a change um, from the dairy perspective, uh, which is, it, it's a nice place to be in uh, when giving these outlooks. Um, so one of the first things that we're taking a look at um, with, with planting, um, it, it, you know, what we found is uh, trying to get things um, planted and to actually get things to grow, uh, we need a bit of balance in the environment. And one thing that we've seen is um, in Europe, they're getting entirely too much heat um, and typically not enough rain, and that caused them some problems at the end of last year, and it's actually something that may be manifesting a bit this year. Uh, it had the same implications for Australia, not a lot of rain, um, and they're really struggling with, um, with growth of forage. Um, we're at the other end of the spectrum this year, um, and what we're looking at is um, between uh, June and, and May, oops, sorry about that, um, between June and May, um, that we basically um, saw the uh, wettest and most precipitation that we've seen since record keeping began. 
Um, and that's pretty significant. Um, and it absolutely had an impact on when people got started planting. Um, it's had an, an impact on the prevent insurance and the folks that are likely to take advantage of that. Um, simply because, um, try as they might, they weren't able to get into the ground. Um, and it's actually having an impact on us um, when we're looking now, now that the corn's emerged, where it stands versus where we've been um, over the last, you know, compared to last year, and then over the average um, for these states at this time. Uh, it's got the market pretty um, concerned about what could potentially be coming our way. Um, and that is starting to work its way into um, futures markets. Um, that's also giving us some pause on the dairy side of things, um, because really what we're looking at is um, the implication it has to milk price, um, with feed being one of the largest components at the farm level for profitability. The higher that goes, um, we need to see a, a, you know, a comparable move in the milk price in order not to compromise those margins. And given you know, what we'll talk about here in a little bit more depth with what's going on in U.S. milk production, um, I think that's why we're seeing changes in the feed market or translating pretty quickly to changes in the milk market um, because we're not coming out of any sort of surplus. Um, we've got a pretty tight and balanced milk situation currently. It's a matter of me figuring out which button wants to move this today. Um, the, the other thing that we've got is it's not just what's happening in the U.S. We've got um, army worms in China, um, and that actually did um, start to rumble through the news um, back in May. Um, it did cause a bit of a move in, in the futures market. Um, so when we, when we contemplated where we were um, and we were reaching contract lows at the early part of May, and as we were exiting May into June, the markets were accelerating. Um, it was a combination of not only what was going on domestically with our weather patterns and the delays that we were seeing in planting, um, but there's some pretty significant concerns in China as the second largest corn grower behind the United States um, that they could suffer um, quite a bit of damage this year um, because of this pest. Um, currently, the, the latest reports are showing, um, you know, it's a pretty small amount, 92,000 hectares that are affected. China's got over 42 million in corn. Um, so really, they've got uh, plenty of ability to, to manage this. The issue, though, is how quickly um, this army moth can, um, army worm moth can travel and how fast they can um, create devastation to a crop. And that's really one of the other catalysts that was um, lifting these markets here recently. So um, this is, you know, this is the chart that we're looking at when we take a look at um, December 19 corn futures. What we were looking at at the very end of April, beginning of May, was a situation where traders um, were what we would call net short. They had sold more corn than, than, than they had owned. Um, and, and as a result, they were looking um, pretty particularly at the African swine fever outbreak in China and the potential impact and reduced need for feed. Um, they were looking at our carryout crops from last year, and they were looking at the trade situation um, that had deteriorated between China and the United States. Based on those things combined, um, we actually set a contract low at the very first few weeks of May. Um, now, honestly, I've heard that some dairy producers have taken advantage of those numbers, um, but it was a matter of days before the market um, took off, and we actually, a week ago, set new contract highs. So um, considerable amount of change in maybe 40 days time. Um, and a large portion of that has to do with the fact that hedge funds were net shorts in the market. Um, when they attempt, because they hold such large positions, to reverse themselves, um, it's a bit of a bull in a china shop. Um, and that's exactly what we're seeing with these markets today. Um, some are still concerned that with the progress that we've made so far, it's, um, it's not going to get us to where we need to be. Um, and there's actually concerns that as we get to December, um, some of the weather forecasters have suggested we could see things um, with weather conditions that could land um, sometime late summer and before harvest that we could potentially see um, $5 corn. And again, you know, that seemed like a pretty distant and remote um, move based on where we had been since 2015, but given where we're at today, it's a, it's a pretty short move over, over what we've been seeing. 
Um, Alpha is something that we need to keep an eye on. Uh, Lori had mentioned winter kill, and we had heard quite a bit of that um, in different parts of um, Kansas, um, parts of Wisconsin, Iowa, some of the areas that were really hit with some severe winter conditions, um, that, that we saw some winter kill in that. That may also um, cause some issues um, with the um, reestablishment of those crops and actually potentially losing a cutting this year. Uh, we also had some farms out west. We've seen considerable amounts of rain, um, and folks were unwilling to cut their alfalfa. They just didn't want the rain damage. Um, so that was a, another delay. Um, but one of the things that I did take a look at um, in your area was Wisconsin's first cutting progress is 77%, according to the USDA, um, as of June 23rd, compared to 92% a year ago. We're starting to hear um, some rumblings to the, uh, to the south of you in Kansas, Texas, that alfalfa has become, um, especially the dairy alfalfa has become a little bit tighter. Um, and you can start to see that when we get to the right side of these charts here, that the alfalfa price that's reported by NAS that actually um, has an impact on the dairy margin coverage program, um, that those numbers are starting to push um, higher and to levels that, again, we haven't really seen these numbers since 2014. Um, and that is having an impact on the DMC program. It's also having an impact on farm margins. And speaking of the new DMC forecast, um, here it is, and this is recast with um, the changes that USDA made to the program when it was reauthorized last year. Um, one of the most significant changes um, that they made to the calculations, and actually the only change that they made to the calculations, um, was to include um, a 50% allocation for premium alfalfa and a 50% um, for regular alfalfa. There was some feedback that the regular alfalfa was not um, capturing what dairy farms actually pay. And so as a result, um, USDA made a modification. Um, what that's done, and we'll talk a little bit more about the program um, a little later on when we get to hedging, but what it's done is um, for those looking for that um, insurance level at about that $8.50 to, to $9 range, um, you can see clearly, you know, we're below those levels all the way through May. We don't quite have the May final numbers out here. We'll get them later today. Um, but the e expectations are um, for any farms that are signing up for that program um, that the payments at this point are projected to exceed the cost of sign up and any sort of premium that's um, charged for the minimum amount. Um, there's also the consideration that if we don't quite see these numbers um, materialize um, on the margin side through the rest of the year, because this is what the futures prices are forecasting today, any further increase in alfalfa or corn um, it actually could make that DMC program pay out um, a little bit more frequently um, throughout the year. So one of the big discussion points that we have today is not only how well the feed is progressing, but the quality of the feed. So while the, the crops are in the ground, um, there's some who are concerned that the nutritional value of the alfalfa, of the corn that we've planted, um, may not be packing the punch that it has over the last few seasons. Um, that's pretty significant when we start to look at output per cow. Now, we recognize that there are other things that influence output per cow, but feed um, and, the, and the nutrition that the animal is getting um, really does make a significant difference when we're looking at um, pushing those output numbers. Um, and, and one of the issues that we have today is that our milk production was hovering just below year ago levels in May. And if we break it down, um, you know, we're running at about 89,000 heads fewer cattle than we had last year in the dairy in the milking herd. Now what that means is we've lost approximately um, 176 million pounds worth of milk because we just have fewer animals. The offset to that has been for the animals that remain, the output per cow is high enough that we've added back um, nearly 110 million pounds. What folks are really concerned about is later this fall when we start feeding um, the, the feed that's being grown today, if the nutritional quality isn't there, that we could actually start to see the output per cow numbers drift a bit lower. And at the same time, having fewer cows, although um, we do expect to have a few more than we have today, um, based on where the milk prices are, that that um, could be a second reason as to why U.S. milk production just continues to remain flat through the rest of this year. Um, and that's having a profound impact on um, price expectation today. 
Um, and so when we take a look at what the, you know, what feed means for those milk prices, um, one of the, th the gauges that we use is the um, DMC uh, margins uh, because it's a good calculation. It's a, it's a general gauge that says, you know, when we're in this period where milk prices are approximately, you know, in that six to $7 range, um, depending on where you're at in the country, we, we tend to expect to see, um, you know, milk pretty well hold. When we get above that $8 number, we expect to see milk um, on, the, on, the, on the rise. And that's pretty consistent with what we're seeing here. When we get those margins well above eight, um, and the number has moved up simply because labor interest, um, utilities, uh, fuel costs, all of those things have been marching up here over the last couple of years. You know, it used to be at $6, we'd say, oh, the market's um, in a bit of a holding pattern. And now that number is probably closer to seven that the market goes into a bit of a holding pattern. And at eight, we're still in an expansionary mode. Um, we tend to track um, not only the United States, but our four largest uh, milk producing states to get a gauge as to where we're at. Um, what's interesting here is that milk production growth has slowed. Um, in fact, we've kind of gone backwards here a few times, um, but we're, we're pretty well holding with where we were. Um, and that would suggest that any increase in the feed price at this point is going to need to be matched with an increase in the milk price. Um, you know, right now at $9, that may suggest that we could see a little bit more activity. Um, you know, farms looking at, once again, slowing down culling activity, looking towards expansion. Um, but I think with, uh, you know, we've kind of been there, done that a few times um, since 2014, where we get a really great forecast of where prices could be, only to watch it evaporate. I think farms are going to want to see a little bit more proof. And based on these numbers, what we can see is that really did not show up in the first quarter. And that's likely why April and May are continuing to do what they're doing. Um, while April is um, considerably better than 2018, that's a pretty low threshold or a low bar to take a look at. Um, and I suspect May is going to look very similar to April. Um, so we're really not expecting farms to really notice that uptick until we start to get to that June um, milk check. So before we roll into the market disruptors, any questions on feed and the implications for markets? I do not see any in chat, and I know a couple people um, are just kind of joining on. So a reminder that your phones are muted. If you've got a question, in the lower right-hand corner of your screen should be a chat function. And if you send your question either to everyone or if you send it just to the panelists, we'll be making sure that we get those questions answered from Sarah. So just a reminder for that. Otherwise, there's no questions at this point. Okay, super. So, um, so when we look at market disruptors, uh, we can clearly say the market that we've been in um, between 2015 and today, it looks very different than what we had come out of um, for the, the prior five years. Uh, what we're starting to see is that our, our, the periods with which milk prices remain um, somewhat low or stagnant can, can last a lot longer um, than those upticks. And there's a few reasons why, so we'll try and highlight some of um, those big significant changes that are out there. Um, one of the first things to pay attention to, um, and I, I tried to give you the U.S. Um, and then somewhere um, the, the upper Midwest and that Great Lakes states. Um, the thing we're really seeing is that farms are getting bigger and bigger. You know, we've got far fewer farms, but the average cows per farm are continuing to rise. <clears throat> we don't expect to see a shift in this trend. Um, you know, there'll be years where it seems to slow down a bit, years like last year where we see a pretty good size uptick in the exit for smaller farms. But overall, we expect this to continue. Why is this important? Well, when we take a look at um, how farms are going to compete for feed, for land, for other resources, um, how they're going to benchmark, um, understanding that those numbers will likely be established by the most efficient producers, not only in the area, but in the country. Um, and we can even expand that to the world. You know, when we start to look at who farms, U.S. farms are competing with, you know, ultimately it's going to be large farms in Michigan, South Dakota, Texas, Idaho. Um, but we could also jump all the way over to Ireland, Poland. Um, these are things that when our farms are looking at cost of production and how to manage, um, you know, what's a reasonable milk price, it's not just what's happening here or just down the street from you. It's actually 
um, whoever the most efficient group is and how well they can produce and what's happening in their world um, because it, it, the scale is becoming far more significant um, because of the consolidation that we've been going through and continue to go through in dairy. Um, and as I alluded to here, it's a global marketplace. It's not just what happens um, in the United States that will influence our pro prices. In fact, if we take a look at it, um, if we roll all the way back to 2014, while our prices were particularly strong, some of the issues that we were running into is that very dark bar there with the European Union. Um, they were a little late to the party with some of the expansion that we saw in Southeast Asia. And as soon as they got removed quota from their system, uh, we saw massive expansion um, at a time, a point in time with which um, demand was actually slowing down. And it was that 2014 to 2016 timeframe that I would argue from Europe that put the pressure on our prices from 2016 all the way to the beginning of this year. Um, so this is something, a concept that farms are really going to have to understand. You know, while we've got an extremely large dairy market um, and a very particularly strong dairy market, we're exporting, you know, somewhere between 14 and 17 percent of our milk solids. And that little swing up there um, will be able to work its way through our system pretty quickly. And, you know, as we continue to see growth in the U.S. market, um, we'll be able to move more continue our milk here, but a lot of the growth is happening overseas. So as we inch those um, milk solids overseas higher, we can expect to see that we'll have more impact on our, our prices here domestically. Um, cheese is king, and, and this number is becoming more and more um, of a heavy weighting. And in the upper Midwest, everybody's quite aware of how important cheese is because it influences about 85% of your total milk check. Um, but when we take a look at it, um, cheese and whey will account for approximately um, over half of our milk solids. Um, I would imagine we ticked over in 18, and that number will continue to expand into this year. What that means is fluid milk is becoming far less influential. Um, butter powder um, is taking up another 18%. So if we take a look at it, almost you know 65 to 70 percent of the total milk price in the country will be based off of what's happening in manufacturing um, very little of it um, ha is influenced by what's going on um, in the consumer products market today um, that's why we pay such particular attention to how much cheese people are consuming um, and what rate of commercial disappearance that we have so how quickly our cheese is vanishing into the system um, when we take a look at the cheese whey category, right around just over 20% is cheese. Um, and that increase in cheese um, at around 2% is helping to offset the losses that we've been seeing in fluid milk over the last few years at around 1% to 2% per year. Um, one of the biggest things that we have to pay attention to, and I think we've all been doing this since around 2006, um, China is the world's largest importer of dairy products. We don't expect that to change anytime too soon. And right now, China is buying a lot of dairy products, and that is likely what's helped to lift our product prices um, as we head into the second half of the year. But as we've learned, um, what follows a big buying um, trend with China is a pretty quiet time frame. We saw that in 07, 08. Um, we saw it again in 2011, um, and we saw it in 14. Um, right now, China's on quite a bit of, uh, you know, they're buying quite a few dairy products. But when China slows down, there just isn't anybody behind them that can replace the void that they've left. Um, and that's really what that right hand chart is showing you there. Then when we take a look at total skim milk powder and whole milk powder imports. Um, China is just such a significant portion of the volume that if they back down, um, it takes several countries to backfill. Um, and typically, it's followed by a period of strong prices, so we're pushing milk output. Um, and that's why when China slows down, we tend to get big corrections and why we pay so much attention to what's happening there. Um, the block barrel spread is something that we'll continue to talk about, um, especially in areas that are heavy cheese production. And as I said, about 85% of the milk check in the upper Midwest is influenced by cheese. Um, so this wide block barrel spread is something, you know, that we're, we're keeping a close eye on. Um, and when we start to take a look at where we are um, this year, 
it's pretty comparable to where we were in 2018. The spread's been widening and tightening, um, but it's something that we just don't expect to go away. And why is that? Most of the cheesing in the country is priced off of blocks, um, and it's 40-pound blocks at that. 40-pound blocks are typically the cheese that we export, um, and exports have been particularly strong here recently. So when we sit down and take a look at it, um, barrel cheese, a lot of that goes into processed cheese. A lot of that makes its way into food service. Um, so that's why going forward, you'll hear a lot of discussion about what's happening in exports because that has a pretty distinct influence on the 40 pound block market. And you'll hear a lot of discussions about restaurants and how healthy the sales are there um, because right around 43% of total cheese goes into food service and a large portion of that is where the barrel or the processed cheese makes its way. Um, and so when we take a look at what the, you know, when we start talking about the spreads, we want to know what the impact is on the milk price. Um, and, and this is really what we're starting to see here is when those spreads get to a wide, um, as they were at the beginning of the year, 18.6 cents, um, that has a way of making its way um, into the milk price. Historically, we've assumed that number is about three cents. So in this scenario at the beginning of the year, um, that could have almost, you know, theoretically a, a dollar fifty impact, um, that that's something that's coming through the system. Um, now, there's some other math around that with, with um, a percentage weighting, but right now we've got about half block, half barrel being reported into the National Dairy Product Sales Report. Um, so again, this is why it's important. It has a significant impact on where that class three milk price will go. Um, and then the flip side of it, where I mentioned that, you know, we keep, we want to see that cheese production um, or the cheese commercial disappearance number closer to 2%. Um, it's because it's offsetting some of the losses that we're seeing on the fluid side. And why are we seeing the fluid side? Um, because we've got a lot of non-dairy alternative beverages out there and their share has been growing at a pretty good percentage, um, which is so much more selection available in the marketplace today. Um, we're just seeing um, consumers make those choices um, and, and it's at times, you know, it's not that we've lost any penetration um, into households. You know, milk is still in 96% of households in the United States. It's just that some of these um, non-dairy beverages are also making their way in. Um, and so what we're expecting to see is, as we see a little bit more shrink um, in demand for the fluid side, it's being, it, the uptake is over on the cheese side. Um, the one thing we do need to pay attention to is it's not just beverages. Um, and this is a trend that's happening. We're seeing it pop up in yogurts, in, in cheeses, um, in ice creams and other things. And so those are areas that we're keeping a pretty um, close eye on today. Um, it's a world that we're going to be living in. People are looking for interesting alternatives, um, markets willing to su supply them for a variety of reasons. Um, and it's just something that we've got to pay attention to because um, dairy is, you know, the Goliath in these categories. Um, and those little bit of compromise that we may see in markets um, tend to have a profound impact on price. But, you know, while we're showing pretty substantial numbers, it's on a pretty small base. You know, let's keep in mind that when we look at things like milk sales, um, plant-based beverages are only 15% of the total market. Um, so when we sit down and take a look at it, the perspective of it is, you know, where it is. Like down below, I'm showing that non-dairy cheese sales have got, grown by 43%, um, but I don't even think it registers 1% of total sales today. Uh, one of the things that we've been paying attention to as of late is these down cycles seem to last a little bit longer. Um, as I mentioned, what's going, what happened with Europe um, when it lost the market into Russia, when it came off of intervention, and at the same time China slowed its buying, it was a bit of a trifecta of things that could go wrong for the market. Um, and we wound up with a, a pretty much a protein glut with skim milk powder that sat in a warehouse. Um, that protein glut lasted for quite some time. Not only that, it influenced um, protein that winds, uh, finds its way into cheese also. Um, so what we were looking at here is um, one third of the time in the last five years, the class three price has been above the five-year average of 1633. 
So it gives you an idea that two thirds of the time in the last five years, we've spent below the average class three price. And if we look at just where we've been since 2015, you know, clearly we're, we're just over a dollar less than that average because that five-year average still contained a few of those months from 2014 that were particularly high. That's not a whole heck of a lot different than the last decade, which is about 1648. Um, and what this would tend to tell us is given the global nature of the market, given where low cost producers ride, uh, reside, it's quite possible that we could be looking at somewhere at about 1650 is the average class three price that we can expect to get from the market over a consistent period of time, um, bearing in mind that we could spend substantial amounts of time below those numbers. Um, so what that means is something like this year where we could spend quite a bit of time above the average, typically that's gonna be followed by a substantial portion of the time that could be below that number as well. Um, but for farms to understand that 1650 is likely a number um, given the cost of production today that we could man we could expect to see going forward. Um, so with those market disruptors in mind, kind of the, the continued consolidation at the farm level, the globalization of dairy and the influence that will continue to seep into our markets from overseas, um, and then some of the domestic shifts in our markets and what we expect to see from milk price. Any questions before we jump to risk management? I have not seen any come through on chat. Okay, well, um, part of the discussion of market disruptors um, really has to do with risk management and why it's becoming increasingly important for successful dairy farms and dairy processors. And really what it is, is it's as simple as, as these five categories. You know, we know in any year it's gonna be weather, natural disaster, international markets policy or supply and demand that's gonna move our markets. And each of them has a, a varying influence on those markets. The question though is which one of these is gonna influence the market that year? And you can see even the experts tend to get it wrong. You know, if we take a look at the corn markets, they were specifically looking at um, international markets and supply and demand or policy quite possibly. They were looking at trade disputes and they were looking at carryout stocks. What they didn't see was that far left box there with weather. Um, and that ended up being the wild card this year. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, when we sit down and take a look at risk management, why it's so important, a lot of times it's things that are well outside of the control of any processor or farm. Um, and that's what, um, that's what a risk management is attempting to do with a solid plan is to, to navigate through that unscathed. So one of the things that I added in here for the farm perspective is benchmarking. And why is benchmarking important? You know, I'm showing here some, um, as an accountant, I feel important to, to throw in accounting terms um, once in a while, but earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization. And this really gives us an idea of the cash flow that these farms have available. Um, and this is a survey done by Ginsky Mulder of some of the largest farms in these areas, their clients, they consolidate and aggregate the data and they release it once a year. And we can expect to see that the 2018 data, when we get that, will be a bit less than what we've been seeing. Um, but still, this is, this is, these are the farm groups that U.S. farms are competing against. And it's important to understand that these farms um, are the most cost competitive in the market, typically. Um, they're getting funding, other things. Um, but also, um, these are the farms that, because of technology, because of refrigeration, um, because of our ability to process at such an enormous level, we can transport the product pretty easily throughout the country. Um, so farms have to understand, even though you may be in Wisconsin <clears throat> or Minnesota, you're likely competing against farms in Idaho and Texas. So it's a really good idea to understand what they're up to. But I can assure you most of the farms in this category in some form or fashion are doing some, some sort of risk management in order to manage their margins so that they can continue to um, provide the returns that they need to for their, for their banks, for their businesses, um, and for expansion plans. Um, so if we sit down, and I just took kind of an example here with some of the numbers that I pulled from the prior page. You know, we take a look at milk feed, um, milk over feed numbers at 738, so that would be a little bit of a holding pattern. And then we kind of back off the average for those, mar for those areas as to um, you know, what their costs are un under varying categories. What it's saying is that at 1603, 
and an 865 or a milk overfeed of 738, if your costs are running at these levels, you can expect to get a return of about 41 cents a hundred weight. The issue though, is that everything in that, you know, that I've circled there in the red is largely market driven. You know, where the milk price goes, where the feed prices go, um, that has everything to do with what's going on in the market. And that's typically outside of the control of any farm. Um, but what we take a look at is that area in the green. That's really where farms drive profitability. Um, that's where they can, um, with more focus, ensure that they're going to hit the returns that they're looking at. And really all risk management is attempting to do is manage that um, area in the red circle there to a number that, that the farm feels comfortable that they can hit. Um, and then basically turn them back from market watchers into um, those who are processing and focused in on the areas that they can drive profitability for their organizations. Um, so one of the analogies that I've had recently for farms is, you know, if we sit down and talk about crop yields, um, which is not an area of my expertise, um, but one of the things that I was looking at is, for some farms, when they contemplate risk management, it seems like something um, completely overwhelming. And I would say as a risk manager, I look at crop yield and feel like that would be completely overwhelming. When you start to think of all the things that could impact a crop in any given year, um, there's a lot of uncertainty out there. But what I would argue is that never stops somebody from attempting to plant. Um, and that's kind of the, the philosophy with risk management. There's a lot of uncertainty, there's some complications, but it shouldn't stop you from managing risk. Um, and here's just kind of, a, you know, for, for those who want to take a look at this at a later time, it, risk management, is, I'm going to give it to you, it's not easy. Um, it takes a lot of discipline and it does take some work. But what I would say is if you have organizational buy-in, so the farm understands what it's doing, they're working with their accountant and baker, so you've got buy-in at all levels. Um, you have to be disciplined in your approach. Um, you really want to be systematic about it. You want to have structure. You want to remind yourself that those targets that you set were there for a reason. Um, it has to be intelligent uh, decision-making. Uh, you're going to change. You're going to modify based on what's happening. Um, you know, this idea that I hope that the milk price is going to go where I want it to, you know, sometimes that may work. Oftentimes, um, hope is not going to get it done. Um, and then it's just sitting down and understanding all the tools that are available to a farm and what they can do um, in order to manage risk. The big thing here is we've got price discovery. We've got a market um, at the CME that trades every day, um, barring trading holidays, that helps us understand where we're going to set those prices. Um, and the nice thing is, is with our federal order system, or even those who are being paid under a cheese yield, there's a structure to understand how to translate those prices back into a, an estimate of milk prices. Um, and that's really key and instrumental to making our markets worth work. We don't need a ton of volume. We just need a good sample um, and a representation of where somebody was willing to buy or sell it on any given day so that we understand what the, what the future price may be. Uh, may be in the markets. And here's my cautionary tale. Um, if we take a look at last year, um, you know, and, and we take a look at where we were at the end of May, we had, um, you know, similar, albeit a bit lower now, um, price projections. And actually, if I roll back to where we were at the very end of May, they were almost identical. Um, and that was prior to um, the trade war or the trade dispute that was started with um, China and with Mexico. Um, and then we take a look at what happened and where the market actually went. And by October, our expectation of price was substantially different than where we had been in May. And that's really what risk management is all about. At some point, even though 2018 was not a spectacular um, milk price year, there was a point in time with which farms could lock in well above $16 milk. Keep in mind that I said that, you know, that our average over the last few years has been 15. That doesn't mean that there isn't a point with which the markets get optimistic. And that's really where some of this discipline comes in and having these groups um, where you're sitting down, taking a look at um, your risk numbers, your margin targets, um, and, and basically taking some of that risk off the table so that the farm understands that it will continue to make money 
um, whether or not you know we have some unexpected events um, because pretty typically the higher the prices go the more we're likely to correct lower and and you know as the saying goes low prices cure low prices high prices cure high prices what risk management does is you tend to attempt to capture right around the average adjusted for the cost of the transaction. Um, so really the question is, is why should a farm even contemplate risk management? And I would say, you know, if you're somebody who's got very, very low cost structure and you can withstand the ups and downs of the market, your, your approach may be a low cost, um, a low cost producer. But I would argue you need to benchmark that not only against the best U.S. farms, but I would take a look at um, what's happening in Ireland and Poland as well, because those are very, very low cost producers. If you're capable of hanging at those levels, OK, maybe maybe there's less that you have to do. If you're somebody who wants to grow, if you've got a good a bit of leverage in place, um, if you're looking for stability, that's where I would tend to say. Um, risk management is important. Um, the reason is, is unmanaged margins tend to find their way um, into your controllable costs. And that world that I said that the farm lives in in the green circle, um, what it ends up doing is it, it forces you to make decisions that you might not have otherwise made, um, and it's, it actually harms the organization. You know, why would you use risk management? Well, because you can separate the pricing. You know, we know farms take spots pricing um, pretty often and risk management allows you to separate the process of selling the milk um, and then also establishing a price so those two things can be done um, separately from each other much like you do with feed and when we sit down and take a look at the tools there haven't been more tools available to the farms as we've had this year we've got the uh, the redo of the the dmc program um, we've got the new dairy insurance program that started last year. Um, and then we've also got the futures options and forward contracting that we've had for some time. Um, and here's just an example of um, the different tools when we sit down and take a look at it from a market, market structure perspective. And I was just trying to attempt to provide you some of the differences um, and how these work. Um, and if anyone's got questions about them, you can always reach out to Lori and I'll be more than happy to, to answer some of those. Um, so before we, we go on to the last little bit of outlook and forecast, any questions on risk management? We do have a couple that came in. Um, the first one was, how um, do you think ASF could impact the global weight market? Um, well, um, I'm going to actually table that one because I'm going to talk about that in about a minute. Perfect. Very good. Um, and then the next question um, from a risk management standpoint, particularly from a lender standpoint, I can't emphasize how much we agree with your comments on that. Um, I really liked your comment about there's a lot of uncertainty, but it shouldn't stop you from doing risk management. So for someone that has never done a lot in risk management, what would be your recommendations to get started? Would it be DRP, DMC? Um, there's a lot of different tools out there that clients have available to them, depending on how comfortable they are with doing that. But is there tools that you would recommend someone start in if they're unfamiliar in doing a lot with risk management? Yeah, I mean, I would absolutely say DMC is, 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 is whether you're small or big, I would probably, to the degree that you can sign up for the minimum um, amount, uh, it's it, it, because they're giving you a look back at the markets, um, it, it actually is going to pay out this year. So, so that's something that is really important. Um, I would I would absolutely avail myself of that. If you're going to do dairy RP, what I would suggest there is the program is it, it's a revenue insurance program, so it's a function of volume and price. Um, and so I would absolutely, if you're going to do that, don't talk to your crop insurance folks. Talk to your bankers, because I think they've got a lot of folks who are trained in this. Talk to other dairy people, because this is, while the program's got some similarities to the crop insurance programs, it's dairy. And, you know, and I've heard some, some stories that would, you know, kind of um, raise your eyebrows, I guess I would say. But those who are working with dairy advisors, be it your bankers or others, um, I would suggest that that's probably the most prudent path. 
if you're looking, um, depending on size, uh, you know, with the with the futures and options, one first stop is if you're a member of a co-op, see if they have programs that they can offer, because typically they can do them in smaller quantities that are more appropriate for the farm. Um, but I would also understand your, your milk check because you want to hedge in a very similar format to how you're being paid. You know, in the upper Midwest, it's pretty easy. You're going to focus primarily on class three. Um, in other areas, it's a little bit more complicated. Um, but those are some places to start. Once you kind of get a handle on how that works and you apply it consistently, then I would say, you know, start to look to those futures and options because they just give you a little bit more sophistication, a little bit more um, uh, opportunity, I guess is what I would say, to structure the program that's custom for you. Totally agree with those comments. I think great comments. There was a question, um, is there a better time to market than others? Yeah, pretty typically. I mean, honestly, the second half, um, the second half of the year is always a good time to look. Um, if you ever watch the futures market, we tend to like to have what's called carry. So we expect that today's, you know, tomorrow's price will be more expensive than today and so on and so forth. Um, so there are times where the market tends to want to lift up. Um, and that's normally when milk's low and we're headed into the demand season of the holidays. So those are really good times to take a look at things. Um, on the flip side of it, um, the second quarter, often is not the best time. Now, this second quarter is a little bit um, unusual, but typically when you're in the flush and there's plenty of milk in Europe and the United States, the market gets a little pessimistic. So um, if you were to take a look at futures price history, you'll see that that's pretty consistent. Um, but like I said, this is a study and it's an exercise and there are people out there that can pull that stuff for you. And I think there was some sort of DRP question, how far out to go? Again, that one, it, what I would say there is it's a function of volume and price. For DRP to pay out, you're insuring a love, you're insuring a, 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 an amount of revenue based on the milk that you're, you're insuring at. So you have to contemplate that even if you say, oh, I want to insure it, you know, $17 milk, well, you're insuring at a max 95%. So we automatically know you're insuring against a 5% decline from $17. Um, and, and then there's some adjustments if output per cow is rising and things of that nature. So um, again, I would suggest sitting down and talking to some dairy advisors. Um, but you know, statistically, you start like I said, the average price over the last 10 years has been about 16.50-ish. Those are things that you're going to want to sit down with your advisors if those milk prices are pushing well beyond that, and contemplate what the cost is of insurance and, and whether it's appropriate for you or not. Great comment, Sarah. Okay, so let's jump to outlook and forecast. Um, this is no strange coincidence. The pace of slaughter has been very high in the United States um, and that we have fewer cows than we did a year ago. Um, those two things are working together to really slow milk production down. Typically, we want to see the U.S. under most circumstances, one to one and a half percent growth rate in milk supply. Um, and right now we're below that number. We're about as close to zero as we could get. Um, and it's largely because we've reduced the size of our, of our herd. Now I do expect to see um, that maybe the culling continues for a little bit, but as we start to see these milk prices climb above $17, I suspect larger farms um, and even those who are benefiting from these higher prices, namely, you know, um, well, pretty much anybody producing class three and class four milk today, um, we're going to start to see the pace of that slow down, I would say, for mid to lar larger size farms. Um, dairy cows are inexpensive, but those prices are starting to come back here a little bit. Um, we did at the, the very end of last year, beginning of this year, see those numbers drop to levels that we haven't seen in a while. Um, and, and that has, you know, that really did keep folks from exiting the business. And now that we've started to see those numbers re recover here a little bit, we may actually see some folks um, try to get out with a little bit of money. Um, so actually that could work to, um, to um, cause a little bit more turnover at the farm level. Whoops, sorry about that. Um, okay, so here for the African swine fever, um, it is a mixed bag. Um, and here's the mixed bag. Um, if you're exporting sweet whey powder, if you're exporting lactose, um, even w, some of the WPC products, it's becoming a problem. 
um, we can absolutely see that China's um, weight imports are down considerably. I think they're down about um, 50% versus where they were a year ago. The U.S. is really feeling the brunt of that um, because we're down 75%. So, you know, despite the fact that China is down, we're feeling more of it than the Europeans. Um, and that's going to likely weigh on that way price through the rest of the year. And when we get to the forecast, you'll see I expect that we're going to try and drift towards that 30 cent level. Lactose is probably in the 20s right now. Um, and there's some pressure there. Simply, we just don't have the animals in Asia um, to consume um, the whey. We expect to lose 30 to 40 percent um, of the world's hogs in this year. Um, Vietnam has gotten worse. Um, it's spread to Hong Kong. Uh, we've got it in North Korea. Um, I think we, I just saw it the other day in Laos. It's, it's, it's a really tough di disease to manage. Um, and so we just have fewer animals eating that feed. The flip side of this, though, is I think it's actually not a bad story for the other dairy products, the ones that the human beings consume. And that is, is we're short animal proteins. And if we take a look at it on a value basis, dairy proteins, um, you know, if we take a look at, and I just use USDA numbers, but the last time I ran it, it was about 70 cents for a 22 ounce serving of pork or beef. Dairy for that same 22 ounces of protein was worth about 50 cents. So while we are expensive versus animal pro, or excuse me, plant-based proteins, we're a cost-effective animal-based protein. So I think that may be one of the reasons why we're seeing such strong demand for dairy products today in Southeast Asia. People are looking for animal-based proteins um, for their diets and nutrition absent the pork. Um, global milk production is flat and that is absolutely impacting prices today. Um, and that will likely carry to the end of the year. Um, we are starting to see the Europeans pick up, but if the heat wave um, continues to persist and that um, knocks back their um, pasture systems and we start to see the impact, maybe not as severe as last year's drought, um, but if we start to see that slow their milk production again, um, that could really start to lift prices. Uh, but this flat line with stronger demand coming out of um, the rest of the globe right now um, is working to deplete our stocks at a pretty rapid rate, and that's also working to lift prices. Um, so what we tend to see is the first thing that happens is milk supply slows. The next thing that happens is we see stocks depleted, and we are starting to see some indications of that. The third thing that happens is prices lift. Um, and when we look at our milk production, we're really no different. Um, our numbers fell behind again. Um, so this is the second time this year that we've dipped below the zero level. Um, we still have, you know, we're still um, 89,000 head down, but I suspect that we could see that number um, pick up here. Um, stocks are flat, and this number right there um, is likely what um, helped to catapult the cheese price into the 180s. Um, really, if we take a look at May this year versus last year, it's 2 million pound difference. So if you take a look at the gap that we had in January, we have consumed all of that cheese. What that means is the milk production has slowed down. We have had to use our stocks to backfill um, what we aren't getting in the milk. Um, and if we continue to see that little dot drop below those dark blue lines, that will continue to start, uh, that will continue to push price higher until we get price high enough to ration back demand. Today, I don't know that we're quite there yet, um, but you know, arguably we could run into some issues with our exports which is our next slide here. Our exports have been doing particularly well. Um, we're almost 7% higher than a year ago, but what's remarkable is um, cheddar exports are up 12%. And remember I said the cheddar exports are primarily 40 pound blocks, and those 40 pound blocks have been making their way overseas and not to Chicago. And again, that's another reason why we've been seeing such strong prices. Um, our processed cheese order, which again is mostly barrels, those are actually up quite a bit. Um, so right now, we're in pretty strong position. The concern is, is as we get to probably August forward, we may actually see our exports slow. Um, we continue to have a strong dollar, and on top of that, our cheese price is about 20 to 30 cent premium over the European prices, and overall, that could work um, against us for contracting later in the year because we're just not cost competitive. Um, but that's something that probably doesn't manifest until the very end of this year, beginning of next year as an issue.
Butter production is still lower than last year. Um, you know, with the loss of milk, and actually, um, everybody kind of forgets, but cheese is a significant portion butter fat. And so we are seeing a lot of butter fat making its way into cheese, making its way into half and half and heavy whips. Um, and as a result, we are just not making the butter um, that we did in the past year. And we are starting to see that show up again in our stock number. Um, and this is likely what's pushed that CME number over $2.40. We had tried it a couple of times, couldn't get it to stick. Um, but then when we saw the stocks number, um, we actually shot up. Cream demand is very strong, and I'll talk about that again in a minute here. Um, but what this may mean is, you know, maybe butter price is pushed to 250. But if you take a look, we're pretty consistent with where we were in 2017. So what this may mean is we have strong prices that last into the end of the year, but this may not be some run where we get um, wild spikes, um, simply because normally we need about 300 million pounds of butter to make it to the second half, and we seem to be on track to get very close to that number. Um, cream multipliers are rising. They're very strong. This is the central, so this would be um, in the Midwest. Um, and we are starting at a much higher base than we have over the last few seasons. And we expect to see those numbers spike um, as milk production drops and ice cream and other demand picks up. Um, so this is something that will most definitely slow that churning down. And this is one that we keep an eye on um, to give us a better idea of what could potentially happen with butter. Um, so the key takeaways here are that we are really at three-year highs with cheese. Um, that's likely going to keep that class three price pretty strong into the end of the year. Class three will struggle a little bit with some losses and whey, um, but likely the strength of cheese should offset most of those, but we do expect uh, much better than average performance this year. Milk output still flat, and until we start to see um, a pretty significant shift where we're adding um, a good amount of cows each period, um, we could expect to see that continue. Um, the trade relationship, there's a G20 meeting that's happening to, um, right now. And so we just need to see where U.S. and China trade comes in at. Um, that could have some significant impact on our dairy and feed markets this summer. Um, the fluctuating U.S. dollar, lower dollar, more exports, higher dollar, fewer exports. Um, it's just going to give us some opportunities and threats. I think we've kind of managed through those, but it's just something that we comment on typically. Um, butter markets are starting to move higher. Demand is very good. Um, and I would say up till probably about $2.55, demand will hang in there. After that, we could see some compromise. Um, and it's really today the story is the feed markets, crop progress, um, and where we are going. Um, the stronger those feed numbers get, uh, we expect to see, based on the fact that we've got flat milk production numbers, we expect to see that translate almost immediately into those milk prices through the end of this year. If we do start to see that the feed quality is poor, that could actually keep milk prices lifted to the first quarter of next year um, on expectations that we could have lower output per cow. Um, these are just some, some standard things to watch and an explanation as to why when I show you the forecast, it's probably not going to be exactly right. Um, but here's some ideas you know, where we've been and where we kind of expect to see things come in at. Um, but overall, you know, we do expect to see um, significantly higher prices. Um, on the class four side, you know, some of the strength in that non-fat price should help to lift things. Um, but that's not to say that under certain circumstances, especially when we get to the second half of this year, that gray area says, you know, while I may believe 1750 makes sense on the cheese side, certain, um, certain things happen and we could see some pretty sharp spikes in those prices. Um, and here's the forecast for the blocks and the barrels. Um, again, you know, I, I think when we start to look at those 175, 180 numbers, they make sense. And actually, I'm looking at these, and I think I have the titles reversed because I think with the, the right is actually blocks and the left is actually barrels. I'm sorry about that. But I would say, and these are averages for the month, so I think we could get an NDPS for average of 185 on the block. Um, and I think barrels could it could maintain some strength into the 170s, um, but I do expect some setbacks. Um, but considering those setbacks, those are still you know cheese prices in the maybe the you know low 160s, upper 150s, which is a considerably higher level than wh where we've landed before um, over the last few years. Um, and again, expect to see some spikes when we get to the um, the non-fat price. Um, both in Europe and the United States, you know, we expect to see some of those numbers pull back. 
and with that, um, that is everything on the Outlook. Any questions there? I don't see any questions coming in, but um, if you do have a question and you want to type it into the chat feature quickly, um, we can try to answer it today. Um, otherwise, um, while we're doing that, Sarah, we did have some questions. If some people are interested in subscribing to the Daily Dairy Report, do you just want to touch base on how they can do that? Sure. If you go out to the website, um, dailydairyreport.com, um, at the very top left, it says subscribe now. And if you click the button, it actually just walks you right through the process. Um, we, we use PayPal's, but we do accept credit cards. Um, and the subscription for a single user is $115 for the year. Um, and we typically, uh, we put out articles every day with exception to trading holidays. Fantastic. I know a lot of us here um, internally at Compere subscribe to that. Um, it's great information if anybody's wondering. There is a couple samples out there as well. Um, in addition, I have an app on my phone um, for a daily dairy that I can pull everything up and look at market prices as well. Um, I do not see any other questions coming in, but I sincerely want to thank Sarah for her continued collaboration with Compere um, and bringing this information to our clients and industry professionals. We certainly want to thank our clients not only for attending the webinar today, um, we hope that you found some value to it. Sarah shared fantastic information, relevant industry information um, that we think will be beneficial to your farm as well. But we also want to make sure that we're thanking you, our clients, for your business with Compere Financial as well. So with that, um, you will be receiving a recording of today's webinar along um, with the information provided, so watch your emails for that. And with that, um, have a great rest of the day, and thank you very much for attending.